Everyone, I'm so glad to be here today. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, be brought to the Taylor Swift concert last night by my nine-year-old. <laughs> so if I'm a little tired, I was one of the screaming fathers. That, no, uh, this is the other. Is I, that's why I got my suit on. I slept in it last night. <laughs> Everyone, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, the wisdom of the community is, uh, is a great opportunity for us to dive a little bit deeper. And you're going to notice that it's kind of a greatest hits. Today is a greatest hits of some of my favorite topics to discuss because it melds together to create a picture of vibrance and vitality. And so without further ado, let's get rolling here. So vitality, the state of being strong and active, having energy, and some synonyms involve liveliness, life, energy, spirit, and vivacity. Vibrance, full of energy and enthusiasm, lively and full of life. There is no reason we can't feel this way at any age any age, from that nine-year-old age to that calm daughter that kept me tethered last night when Taylor hit the stage, <laughs> to some of my oldest patients in their 90s. So as we're talking today, I'm going to be hitting some of the high points. This is going to be interactive. We have two breakout sessions where we're going to be discussing things, and I welcome questions. There'll be four pauses throughout the presentation for those questions, and I'll answer any questions that, uh, that I can, and I'll get answers for you if I don't have... Uh, I can also phone a friend. There's two other doctors in the audience. <laughs> so three things to start immediately. One of the topics I discussed uh, presenting this, this, uh, this particular wisdom of the community was how to slow the aging process. And there, if you concentrate on these three different facets, research is now backing this as, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty well conclusive that research supports these three facets as being... Uh, optimal ways to slow the aging process and maximize vitality. So we've got maintaining reasonable glycemic control and, if appropriate, engaging in periodic fasting. Whoa, what does that mean? What's glycemic and fast? Let's talk about that in just a moment. Respecting the circadian rhythm and then establishing regular mindfulness and exercise routines. So to break it down, this really means minimize your refined sugar intake. Okay, to maintain glycemic control means to have your blood sugar stay at a relatively stable state. Now it's normal after a meal, we call it postprandial in the medical world, after a meal to have your blood sugar rise, but there's a compensatory mechanism for storing some of that energy for later usage and utilizing some of it immediately. When we bombard the system with a high level of sugar regularly, it's taxing and challenging. We'll discuss that in more detail. The second is respect the circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm, basically means a 24-hour clock cycle and the body's pattern that it follows through that. So, sir actually means as part of circle and cadian is a day. So that, that circadian rhythm is about that 24-hour clock cycle and we have specific points in a 24-hour clock cycle that we want our body to drop into specific modes of engagement. We'll talk about that. And the last component is mindfulness practices that we discussed. Meditation daily, prayer daily. Incorporate mindfulness into your activities of daily living along with daily exercise. So we'll talk about this in a little more detail also. But the basic idea is to live mindfully. Even some of the events that are going to be routine for us, our meal time should be done in a mindful manner where we're paying attention to the food in front of us, not the smartphone in front of us. Um, our walks can be mindful. We could walk down from our car to the meeting today in a mindful way, thinking and having gratitude for the ability to walk down and come to this great meeting today. So just engaging in your activities of daily living with that awareness. So let's roll through. Glycemic control was my big number one. And let me just show you a quick example. It took me about 30 seconds to pull this next slide together. These are five recent studies that support this claim. So these five recent studies have to do with controlling your insulin level. Now we haven't talked about insulin yet today. Insulin is a hormone that's secreted by your pancreas. And this hormone's job is to allow sugar to enter the cells so it can be utilized. So we want to be in a state of insulin sensitivity, right? If somebody says you're overly sensitive, you might think, ouch, that hurts. But if you're overly insulin sensitive, that's a great thing. It's one of the nicest compliments you can have. <laughs> So <clears throat> insulin sensitivity is highlighted here, and each of these are uh, high-impact journal articles that support that. We're not going to go into detail on this, but I just wanted to show you that this, again, took 30 seconds on a PubMed search, 
and I was able to copy and paste all of this support for this claim, okay? So let's take a step back. There is some confusing information that's shared regularly about health and wellness. And I just did a quick screenshot of three different Time Magazine covers, one from 1964, one from 1984, and one from, I believe, last year or the year before. Let's back up. So this gentleman, Ansel Keys, is a brilliant physician, and he laid out, well, what has guided health policy around dietary recommendations in the 1960s um, he laid that out and it was adopted quickly by, uh, by our government and put forth as proper information. And this was, he's the father of what's known as the lipid hypothesis. So the basic concept here is that fats, certain fats, in particular, here's his quote, artery clogging saturated fats were to blame for cardiovascular disease, which was on the rise in the 1960s. The GIs who came back from World War II and were... Um, unfortunately unable to make it back alive, they, they noticed that these GIs had a high degree of cardiovascular disease in their, in, in, in their body that was underway. So these vets had not perished from that. Unfortunately, they, they perished in, in, the, in the conflict, in the Great War, um, Second World War. But what was identified was there was a, a bizarre tendency of inflammation in their bodies, and in particular, cholesterol deposits. Well, cue up Dr. Ansel Keys, and he did a study called the seven, the seven Country Study. He actually began the study with many more than seven countries involved. And this is, this is where we run into trouble. This is a brilliant man. He truly was. But he was so adhered to his basic, basic hypothesis that he didn't really apply scientific rigor to it. In fact, he was so sure he was right that he began carving away the data points that didn't fit. Okay, so what began is close to, I believe it was a 21 country study got whittled down to seven countries. So in, in science, it's an objective thing, right? We, we've set forth a hypothesis and then we seek to disprove that. You're, you're effectively trying to prove yourself wrong. In this particular instance, this great doctor was so sure that he was right that he, he created a sin in the world of science. So I don't want to discount Dr. Ansel Keys. Later on, he went to support um, nutritional concepts that were in keeping with good science, and he's a very strong proponent of the Mediterranean diet, um, which still holds true today as being an excellent, excellent source of uh, nutrient intake and balance. But this particular decision in the 1960s did follow us as a public health policy even up till uh, a decade ago. So I just want to set that forth. Again, brilliant man, but made a pretty fatal mistake being a little bit too sure of himself. <laughs> and not trusting the data. So we move forward and even <clears throat> 20 years later, we're still pointing the finger at cholesterol as being a problem, right? So controlling cholesterol levels uh, became a high, high focus for allopathic medicine, you know, Western, Western medicine, Time Magazine, and now the bad news. Now, I'm not saying that you all get your medical information from Time Magazine, <laughs> but the distribution is wide, right? I think it just sold for, $13 billion time did sometime last week. So there's, there's some readership there. Somebody decided to value this. So this information's getting out there. So 20 years after Dr. Ansel Keys laid out the seven countries study and the lipid hypothesis, we were still buying it. This is a derivative, a tertiary derivative of that same hypothesis. Well then why is time telling me it's okay to eat butter, which has a high concentration of saturated fat and cholesterol in it? Well, it's because this is where contemporary thinking is going. And by no means am I, am I um, admonishing Dr. Keyes for being wrong. I am admonishing him for his science, lack of scientific rigor, but being disproven is, is not odd. And having this as more contemporary thinking, and I don't know if that's necessarily the best health advice I've seen either, just to eat butter, <laughs> right? So it does control for that glycemic response. There's not a lot to spike your blood sugar in butter, but again, it's a, it's a healthy component of, of a diet, but I, I might have had a more diverse front, front cover. Okay, so now you've got a bit of a history lesson of Dr. Ansel Keys, the lipid hypothesis, and then just an example. And I just picked on Time Magazine because I thought it was interesting to have three different contrasting um, front pages that look like that. So 
here is where the rubber meets the road. So when, when Dr. Keyes laid out the lipid hypothesis and dietary information started being constructed about that, this food pyramid was presented. And what we see here is at the base of the pyramid, the concept here is that the foundational base of the pyramid was eight to 11 servings of grains, bread, cereals, grains, rice, and pasta group. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm Italian and I love me some pasta. But there's nothing we should be eating 11 servings of a day other than water. <laughs> Come on, people, not even blueberries, and I love blueberries. So I, don't, I can't even begin to tell. We could talk for three hours on this right here, but I'm not going to do that to you guys. What I will say is if you cleave that pyramid off right above that grain line, it's not such bad advice. Except for at the top, it does still buy into the fact, you know, the quote-unquote fact that fats, oils were part of the problem. Now, sweets are in there, and I would, I would bold that, right? That those should be done in moderation. So as we get to the top of that pyramid, the concept is in moderation up there. But healthy fats, healthy oils, and when I say that, I mean olive oil, <coughs> avocado oil, coconut oil, even though it has a high concentration of saturated um, lipids in it, it's still a stable oil, a healthy oil. So we've kind of done some work on this pyramid. The funny thing was, in the first revision, they couldn't let go of a pyramid, but this says nothing. <laughs> if you look at this, it's just like, well, well we had a pyramid, and if we, if, we go, if we go to something else, they'll think we were completely wrong. So then they did this. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Every, everything is still there, but it's just, at least this makes sense. It's wrong, but it, it makes sense. Uh, so then we move to this, my pyramid steps to a healthier you. I do like the fact that there's an exercise component in there, and I agree with that 100%. And I see that those are foods at the bottom, and we should be eating food. So I guess they were onto something. But it wasn't so helpful. Uh, the, the, the more recent revision of this is the myplate.gov, and they got it mostly right here. And I say mostly right because now I'm going to flip. The next slide will show you a very similar picture with the absence of the dairy. Is this a laser pointer? Ooh, I don't know. I'm not going to mess with that. The, the little the dairy that's up there at the top. So dairy is absolutely fine for us to be eating, providing you're not intolerant to it. So there's lactose intolerance, where you can actually have a reactivity to the milk sugar that's in there. Lactose is the sugar. Then there's a protein intolerance. It's not an allergy that I'm speaking of, not, not one that would send you to the emergency room like you hear of anaphylactic reactions, life-threatening reactions. But many people upwards of 30% of our population don't tolerate dairy. It can be the sugar that's in there or it can be the actual protein structures. There's two proteins in milk that give people problems. So all of that just to say, when Harvard put this plate out, the healthy eating plate, and I'm sorry it got cleaved a little bit, but what's listed, oh, you can see it on here. Harvard's plate was a response to the US Department of Agriculture's my plate, again, my plate. Harvard's recommendation was to keep those ratios pretty much the same, you just don't see the dairy in there. Okay, and the reason why is because many people are intolerant of it, and you can, despite the American Dairy Council, please don't come for me, guys. Um, their suggestion, it, it's not essential that we be consuming dairy for calcium intake. Broccoli, kale, leafy greens have a high concentration of calcium, as do many other foods. So, I love this plate, it's a good start. The next thing I'm gonna mention is, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all diet, right? So the nutrition needs of an individual vary drastically depending on your activity level, okay? There are hereditary components we take into consideration. Genetics aren't everything, right? The Human Genome Project had us thinking that we were gonna have this unbelievably complicated genome. What we ended up finding out was we're moderately more complicated than an earthworm from our <laughs> genetic code. So it's more about the way our genes express themselves, and that's entirely dependent on the environment in which they're steeped, okay? So the great news about this is we have control over this. These are lifestyle factors. Now, please understand there are genetic abnormalities and there are maladies that happen to individuals that are absolutely out of their control. I'm fully aware of that. We just have a large percentage of morbidity or suffering that happens in our population that can at least be influenced by dietary input lifestyle choices and, and exercise being one of those very important lifestyle choices. And so that's what I want to drive home for you here today. 
These are a couple other pyramids not endorsed by our government uh, and put forth, and I'm not fully endorsing these as the only way, but I just want you to see that in response to the pyramid, <laughs> that pyramid that the, that the government modified from the old traditional one to the guy running up the stairs made people crazy enough that a couple of them said, well, we'll just make our own pyramid. So what you see here is the one on the right, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement of clean protein sources, uh, clean meats, um, Pasture, this means pasture-raised meat, so if you're thinking of like red meat, this would be bison or pasture-raised cattle. Um, very clean. Um, fowl, chicken, you, you would like your chicken and turkey, poultry basically to be antibiotic-free, okay? And it's ideal if it's, uh, if it's uh, free range. We don't say pasture because they don't eat a lot of grass. They eat a little bit of grass. But if you go to a butcher counter and they're trying to sell you grass-fed chicken, I want you to turn around and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> Because they'll be a tiny chicken. Because they just don't eat much grass. <laughs> you know, they want the grubs that are underneath the grass. So if it's going, it might get a little bit of grass. But grass-fed chicken ain't where it's at. Okay, the, the vegetables. I wholeheartedly endorse this. We really want. You know, if we jump back to the plate, I, 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 I love to see half of that plate be vegetables. Okay, and if we choose from, if we choose from a few categories, you can guarantee that you're you're getting potent antioxidants and micronutrients. So I'm just going to give you a quick breakdown. We're used to hearing about carbohydrates and fats and proteins. Those are macronutrients. And that's where the bulk of the end, well, that's where all those three macronutrients constitute where we get all of our energy from, okay? It's either a fat, carbohydrate, I almost said lipid, which is the fat. <laughs> fat, carbohydrate, or protein, okay? What we find is the reason why a calorie is not a calorie I've heard that said in the past. Well, a calorie is a calorie. Why does it matter? If I'm eating 500 calories, that's a unit of measurement. A calorie is a unit of measurement. Why does it matter that it's not Halloween candy and it should be grass-fed, not chicken, grass-fed beef? Okay, why does it matter? Well, it has to do with the way the body responds when the food is introduced to us. Okay, kind of the reason why we're talking about this all under that first heading of glycemic control is this is where the rubber meets the road for glycemic control. If you eat this way most of the time, and I have many friends in the room here who have eaten meals with me and see that I do walk what I talk about 85% of the time. <laughs> so please know that this, is, this doesn't have to be adhered to constantly. It's not that you can never have that piece of wedding cake, birthday cake, or wine, or beer. It's, it's just in moderation. If you're doing the right thing most of the time, the body can easily compensate and control. In fact, I like to describe this to patients as, Having three categories. Think of some foods as being medicinal, actually so rich in micronutrients. For instance, there's a category called cruciferous vegetables. These are high sulfur containing vegetables. So think of broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Um, I'm missing a couple, bok choy, kale, are all cruciferous vegetables. Potent, potent anti-cancer. Now I'm not saying they can prevent cancer on their own, but I'm not saying they don't. <laughs> <clears throat> Way too many causes for me to discuss it at, at once, but it's, it makes the body um, replete with, or it allows the body to be replete with these high sulfur content um, micronutrients, and those build something in our body called glutathione. And so without going into great detail on that, I'll just tell you that's the stuff. Glutathione is the stuff. If you've had too much fun on a Saturday night and Sunday your body is recuperating, you're quickly using your glutathione stores in order to get things back into balance. None of that was going on at Taylor Swift last night. <laughs> Cecilia can't drive. She's nine. So at any rate, we're, so at any rate uh, doing the right thing most of the time. So think of your foods in three different categories. You've either got foods that are medicinal to your body, like the cruciferous vegetables I just discussed. Um, that's just one example, like the grass-fed meat I mentioned, even uh, pasture-raised milk that's derived from pasture-raised cows. If you, if you do well with dairy, cottage cheese is actually an exceptionally rich uh, source of this glutathione and these sulfur-containing compounds. So a varied diet, but really heavily weighted in vegetables and then fruits. And when we talk about fruits, we want to talk about low glycemic fruits. Here's that term again, glycemic. I'm obsessed. The concept is certain fruits will liberate their fruit sugar, which is fructose, um, 
very quickly. Think of, well, orange juice is an example of this. Orange juice spikes blood sugar so quickly that it's actually used for folks uh, who have difficulty maintaining that blood sugar, who need a boost of energy. It's used to bring folks back from a low blood sugar attack. And it's very effective at doing that because it has such a high sugar content. Okay, um, interestingly enough, a piece of white bread spikes the blood sugar almost as much, isn't that wild? Yeah, you wouldn't use that in place of orange juice though because the liquid gets in the system quicker. I wanna mention this too. This is generalized advice up here. I'm not giving anybody individualized health recommendations up here. The legal disclaimer, my lawyer friends in the <laughs> room. You know I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that stuff, but I have to tell you. You wanna road test this stuff after running it by your physician. If I'm your physician, it's good for you. <laughs> so the paleo food pyramid on the left is a construction of basically a concept of keeping these low glycemic um, foods the, the pillars of the eating plan. And again, the one on the right, I just like the construction of it better. The moderate foods that fit into here, the reason why fruits go into moderate and in moderation is because you can accumulate too much sugar by eating a ton of fruit. But that's if you make a smoothie in the morning that is pineapple, banana, and orange juice. Yeah, that tastes good. That's basically ice cream. That's like liquid <laughs> ice cream. So think of berries. Those are your low glycemic fruits. And they are so packed with another category. So we talked earlier about uh, macronutrients, carbohydrates and uh, fats and uh, carbohydrates, fats and proteins. I almost said it again, fats and lipids. Um, but they are loaded in another category, which is known as micronutrients. And these compounds are polyphenols and terpenes. These compounds number, instead of three, like our macronutrients, over 10,000. And the truth of the matter is, we don't even know how many there are. But the benefits are conferred on you by eating it now, okay? Blueberries, exceptionally rich in these polyphenols. Raspberries, my runner up, my next best one. Blackberries, strawberries. So the berries generally are lower glycemic. Pineapple is a higher glycemic food, but it's very rich in a compound called bromelain, which is an anti-inflammatory compound also. So I'm not saying negate that altogether. We just don't want it to be the bulk of your smoothie in the morning or your fruit intake. And then vegetables, vegetables, vegetables. If you cover half of your plate in vegetables, that other half, you've got some more leeway with what you're gonna do. And you'll find that carbohydrates are not a problem. Most vegetables have a very high carbohydrate content. In fact, Fiber, cellulose, is a carbohydrate. It's just one that we don't have enzymes to break down. And so that's why that fiber doesn't liberate energy for us in the form of blood sugar spiking energy. What it also provides, and this is a really, really, really important component, what fiber provides is literally a physical obstruction. It gets in the way. So your body can't get to the sugar as quickly in what you've just eaten. And this is the reason why if I eat a whole orange, that's much better from a glycemic response standpoint than juicing that exact same orange and drinking the juice. Because the fibrous content actually slows the rate at which your body can get in and break down that sugar contained therein, and that helps to control that glycemic response. I hope this isn't too dry. Everybody good? Yeah. All right, cool, awesome. And we'll open to questions in a little bit. Okay, so this is really what I'm talking about, controlling, refined sugar. <laughs> That's the bad stuff, right? That's the bad, yeah. I just, okay, so truth be told, I came back from South Dakota three days ago. And who, who has passed through South Dakota and stopped at Wall Drug? Wall Drug. You can't stop at Wall Drug and not get a donut. So the gods of health and wellness, please forgive me, fellow doctors. Please forgive me, the gods of health and wellness don't strike me down, but I had a bite of a donut because I bought it for Cecilia. Truth, really, it was for her. Honey, you done with that yet? You done with that yet? It was her. She made a good choice too. It looked like the one on the left without all the sprinkles on it because we don't want that artificial color and stuff. They didn't even offer that. But their donuts were exceptional. That one bite did me good. Now, could I have killed that whole donut? Yeah, yeah, but I don't because of what I'm sharing with you. Now, my mom's Texas sheet cake on my birthday, I destroy that. <laughs> it's a whole different thing. And it's got more sugar than that donut in it, but I don't care, right? So this is what we want to control for, refined sugar intake. And again, every once in a while, fine. 
again, my nine-year-old ate half that donut and didn't want any more. It was too sweet for her. And trust me, she's got a sweet tooth just like daddy. But we control enough what she's taking in that she actually can register, whoa, that's almost sickeningly sweet. That process right there, that registration of that sweetness and being able to, uh, and being able to control for that is really the important facet. See, there are compounds in fats that our body senses, and there are certain signals that are sent by hormones contained therein that help to control our, our appetite and give us a feeling of satiety or fullness. Okay, so if we eat a balanced meal that includes fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and, and appropriate ratios, the fats contained in there and the proteins contained in there also, but to a lesser extent, will, if we eat slowly and mindfully, let's go back to the third slide, mindfully, we will have a feeling of fullness that comes over us. Okay, there's an awareness of that. And it's literally a chemical hormonal signature that's being registered by our brain. And it says, you know what, Dan, you're full. I know it's delicious and you want another plate, but you're full. And if I'm eating slow enough, which I don't do enough, but if I'm eating slow enough, then I register that and I stop. That signaling doesn't happen with sugar. So if you take something that's just sickeningly sweet and pick your favorite soft drink, I hope you don't have any favorite soft drinks, but hypothetically speaking, if you had a favorite soft drink and it were one of the colas, it would have an exorbitant amount of acid in it, which is not great for your system, it's acidifying. But that acid needs to be in there because you literally could not stand the taste of that 40 grams of sugar that you're about to down if it didn't have that acid in there to balance it out. Now I'll tell you, you gotta be pretty strict on your sugars to keep them under 20 grams a day because then you're considering what you're taking in from even fruit sources and so forth. I've done that at times, but I spend a lot of time eating up to 40 grams of sugar a day. You can get 40 grams of sugar out of one 12 ounce. In fact, you only need to drink 10 ounces of it, I think, 10, 10 to 10 and a half ounces of it to get 40 grams of sugar. So we don't have to go very far to see how these big drinks, I'm not gonna pick on any one brand because they're all equally as offensive, these big drinks that come out of convenience stores that might be, what are they, 36 ounces? Are they 40 ounces at times? Oh my goodness sakes. So that's enough to give a Cairo a headache. <laughs> right? You're sitting down, I'm glad you're sitting down. Yeah, where's Bo? Okay, so we're taking one step forward, just a mini, 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 a little bit of anatomy physiology, I'll keep it short. So this is a picture of a liver, a pancreas, a part of the small intestine, and the gallbladder. That droopy guy there, well it's labeled, the gallbladder. So, Here's the amazing thing, oh my gosh, the human body, like 10 million amazing things I could stand and tell you about, but the pancreas itself is, is the organ that actually secretes insulin, and we know what that is. That opens the door for the blood sugar to get in the cell. Pancreas has two different jobs. It's an exocrine and an endocrine gland, and all that means is the exocrine part, it makes enzymes that help break down the food, carbohydrates, lipids, and, and proteins, that's the exocrine. And the endocrine part means that it produces hormones that are secreted through the bloodstream. And, it, well, in particular, insulin. Okay? So what gets taxed over time with a higher glycemic load is your pancreas. In particular, um, the cells that produce the insulin. Okay? And what occurs before there is a major imbalance in the body is insulin resistance starts to be set up. So initially we've got of insulin response that should be high, right? Young in our life, kids should receive um, a, a food, breast milk for instance, and instantly absorb some of that sugar. The rest goes into storage for later, and their body has a high sensitivity to insulin. But over time, if we bombard the body with a high sugar intake, this process fatigues the cells that produce the insulin, but more importantly, there are receptors, little, little locks that the key of insulin goes into, and these receptors begin to get downregulated. This is an incredible phenomenon that the body does in so many different areas. It controls the amount of receptors that are present for factors to bind to. But never is it more prevalent than in insulin resistance. Because when there's resistance to that insulin showing up, part of it is the body trying to downregulate the response. Like, Dan's off his rocker. This is 300 grams of sugar today, right? I'm telling you a story when I was 12 years old. It probably happened. I woke up and had... My mom, sorry mom, uh, she made great food around the house, but I also ate Fruit Loops and Oreos and did all that crazy stuff. It was before I found, before I saw the light. <laughs> so, 
there were times where young Dan probably did have 300 grams of sugar, you know, and that's nutso. That's nutso. So insulin resistance, I'm positive. If you would have looked at me, well, the way I behaved, yeah, high school, you could ask almost anybody, you know, running up and down the halls. He's got ADD. No, he's got 300 grams of sugar a day. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, another commentary, too, but not that ADD doesn't exist. But. Okay, back to it. So the pancreas, this is the wonderful gland. Um, not any more important than you, liver. I mean, you're super important, super important. But the pancreas is what we're talking about now with glycemic control, and the fatigue happens at this level. So the great news is, if somebody has made less than optimal decisions around what they're eating, right, and maybe there's signs of insulin resistance that show up. Again, you're not insulin sensitive, we want that. Insulin resistant, it shows up and the body's going, yeah, I'm too tired, I can't even. I can't even, that's what the kids say these days, right? I can't even. So. If that's what's happening, the process of reversing your dietary inputs can allow the body to compensate. In fact, a little bit later we'll be working on a, a, a paper, simple, you won't be graded, uh, but a, a paper where I show lines of differentiation, which means that as we're going along, we can be at a high health status. We can move to a, a health challenge area, but that's a bi-directional line. You can move back to that health status in fact, there's a line of demarcation where tissue does, in fact, change. But we have a lot of wiggle room. What I'm saying is it's almost, almost, never too late to improve these things, okay? This cracks me up, <laughs> right? Evolution, evolution. But you see what the guy far on the right has? He's got that large drink. He's got that. I wasn't going to say it. That's a brand. But you're right, and that's what I kept stopping myself from saying. So yeah, he's got that huge drink. And, and what's gone on here is nothing short of miraculous. This business on the far right hand side is just as miraculous as, as the gent to his left because the body has almost an unlimited ability to store, right? If we go back a little bit before the incredible abundance and, and uh, ability that we have now, if we go back, the ability to store energy was a differentiating point. It was a survival mechanism. So this guy is a survivor on the right-hand side. <laughs> but I've felt too much like him in the past, and I can tell you, that ain't the place to be. And so we help people. I know it ain't a word. I'm sorry. So we help people to move back. And let me tell you, this guy on the right is going to take a lot of work, but he can get to that next. He can jump back. Yeah, even if you pass go, you can still <laughs> jump back. There's hope. The, the body can compensate to incredible things. Incredible, incredible inputs, and it'll decompensate after a certain point. But the compensatory and uh, ability and the resiliency of the body, I just don't want to not leave that impression that the body is so re resilient. Okay, so I, lo I, I love many of the Ivy League schools, but Harvard, I just grabbed a lot of information from them because they're prolific in these areas. So. This is an article, the lower left-hand side actually gives you the details, the actual link to it, but Harvard, to age better, eat better. And Dr. Frank Hugh says, the evidence is very encouraging because even older people, it says old people, when they improve their diet quality, the risks of getting chronic diseases and mortality can be reduced and longevity can be improved. This is undeniable, undeniable. If you feel like you're getting opposing views on health and wellness input, understand that some of that is just confusion and crosstalk that's put out there, okay? Um, we understand that controlling for insulin response is absolutely in your benefit. There are no exceptions, okay? So the elements of a healthy diet were readily available in the Mediterranean where people had to eat local fruit, vegetables, and fish, fish another physician at Harvard. And then in the article they state, much of life is beyond our control, amen to that. But dining smartly can help us live healthier and longer. I couldn't say it better myself. So, questions about the dietary stuff? Yes? So, what is the difference in the diet between? Hold on one second. We'd like to have a. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I rushed. No, you're good. Everybody, everybody wants to hear. You're going to have a great question. It might be theirs, too. So, there you go. What is the difference between uh, fresh, frozen, and um, I'm not going to say canned yeah. because that's yeah, that's kind of obvious. Unless you're talking about beans and tomatoes and things like that that are canned. That's a the wonderful. Process, you know, it's processed. Yeah, but. absolutely. Yeah, wonderful question. First off, you'll notice I keep my responses pretty quick here, and I would love to go deeper on any of the questions we talk about later. But the quick response is this: in certain instances, frozen fruit is actually fresher than the produce that is labeled fresh, and in the market. 
and my mentor and friend and our founder can tell you he worked in the food industry, transporting food takes time and incredible resources. Sometimes that basket of organic strawberries that I bought that came from Watsonville, California, uh, has been on a truck for three or four days. Whereas the, fresh, the, the freshly frozen ones will have a higher nutrient load. And um, second, if I can second that, the movement towards local food and eating food that's been grown nearby um, supports this next statement, and that is that fresh can actually be just as fresh as that stuff that was frozen right away. Okay, so think of eating locally when you can. There are ben many benefits to eating locally that even go beyond that freshness component and could get into some of the traditional Chinese medicine hat that I wear, where your body's actually in sync with your environment. I know I'm getting pretty woo-woo and out there. Okay, crunchy granola boy, put your Birkenstocks away. <laughs> Fair enough, but I know I had that conversation by myself. That was weird. <laughs> it, was, little, it was funny, a little, but Dan, it was funny. It's a little really peek funny. inside what goes on here. So to answer your question, Frozen's great with a lot of the um, fruit I'm telling you about, the low glycemic stuff, it's actually the best. So that, that fruit smoothie in the morning is a great idea. Other questions, Richard? How about supplements? Ah, wonderful question. So this is coming up later, oh, okay. and, um, but thank you. It makes sense to take dietary supplements to fill in gaps, okay? So if, there are nutri if there's nutritional advice that I'm giving you up here that you're not going, I'm doing all that stuff, eh, it might make sense to supplement and in deficiency states that show up with certain disease processes, okay? So certain individuals, either through absorption challenges, maybe they're not absorbing, they're eating a healthy diet but not absorbing it, great. It can make sense to take very, very high quality supplements that are targeted. I do recommend measuring, okay? Um, there are compounds that you can go out and get, and this is not at all, you know, anybody who knows me knows I don't believe in scare tactics unless it's something that's really scary. But there are compounds you can buy off the shelf without a prescription. And, I mean, I don't write prescriptions as a chiropractor. Um, without a prescription that will modulate your hormones in your body, okay? DHEA is one of these. DHEA is wonderful for some people. But if you just hear, hey, DHEA boosts my testosterone, I think I'm gonna take some of that. That sounds good. There's a chance that that might be going the wrong way down the waterfall. If it goes this way, you might get more estrogen. Well, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> so, so there are certain compounds that it's good to have guidance on this. And again, not a scare tactic at all, but you can measure for many of these things. Sometimes blood testing makes sense, but there are other modalities like hair mineral analysis. Um, and then oftentimes you can reference a physician's desk reference that gives direct advice for certain disease processes and know that, hey, I'm pretty safe supplementing in these areas for these issues. And then I will say, big differentiating point, there are water-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins. Fat soluble vitamins you can accumulate in your body at higher than ideal levels. Okay, these are vitamins A, D, E, and K. It's hard to get too much vitamin D. Almost everybody we test for has too low of vitamin D right now. And there's some environmental reasons for that that I won't go into right now. We think, we don't exactly know why. Um, but other than that, A, E, and K, you can accumulate too much of. Okay, particularly vitamin A is a good example. Now, it's a wonderful immune booster. Vitamin A, carotenoids that you read on the back of your supplement bottle. Sometimes it'll say mixed carotenoids. Those are carotene, like beta carotene. You can get too much of that stuff. At one point in time, after I was eating all those Oreos, I decided I'm going to get healthy. And I was juicing. I'm a little out there sometimes. So I was juicing carrots. And I remember juicing. <laughs> I guess it was probably like, I don't know, 30 ounces of carrots. And I was like, I'm going to drink this today. Well, I only got about a third of that down, and then my body said, you're not going to drink any more of this today. In fact, we're going to get rid of some of what you drank. <laughs> <laughs> and that's known as carotenoid toxicity. It, it happens. Yeah, it happens. So, okay. Without wasting any more time there, the supplement question's a great one. Yes, Wayne. Could you clarify, is it, you, you alluded to it with this fasting, but if you wake up in the morning, I hear breakfast is the best meal, yeah. then other people say, no, don't eat, wait till let your body, yeah. no, don't eat yet. Yeah. So, and that along with exercise, is it best to eat before you exercise or eat, great exercise question. and not eat? Yeah, Does great that make question. sense? It makes perfect sense. Okay, I thank you. All and they're wonderful questions, but that many people have, so thank you. Again, this is gonna be a really quick answer to each of those points, and we could go on and on. There is great merit to fasting. We're now understanding that fasting 
and particularly a type of fasting called intermittent fasting, which means you go for spans of time without eating any food, but you'll consume your, your caloric contents for that day in a concentrated way. Maybe you begin eating at 2 o'clock. You've fasted through the night before. So let's say we're going to fast on Tuesday. Monday night I eat dinner at 7, and it's going to be protein-rich. It's going to have plenty of beneficial fats and oils, and it has very little, very little carbohydrates, mostly coming from those vegetables I was talking about. Then I don't eat again till 2 o'clock on the next day. Let's say it's Tuesday's my fast day. My first meal's at 2, and I introduce food again in a very controlled way. We don't introduce the high glycemic load then either. In fact, we rarely do, but it's very important here. That time period between 7 p.m. Monday night, my food was being processed for three and a half hours after that. But after that, my body was going into storage mode and drawing off of stores and so forth. That fasting state that, let's just say, began at midnight and ran all the way to 2 p.m. the next day, that is highly beneficial for your body. We're just beginning to understand how beneficial. But this falls into a category of caloric restriction, which it's caloric restriction over a period of time. Let me, let's say I might still eat 2,500 calories, but I'm going to eat it between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. on that Tuesday. There are benefits conferred on the body by doing intermittent fasting, which I just, is what I just described to you. Now, this is really important, all joking aside, that this be done in an organized way and that you have help constructing this. From somebody who has nutritional knowledge, whether, whether it's a physician or a dietitian, but this is important. We don't want to just dive straight into intermittent fasting like that because you could feel like, oh, I can't do this. My body doesn't do well with this. Really, it's just you tried to run a marathon the first day and you probably wanted to walk for a while and then run a block and then, right? So jumping straight into intermittent fasting like that can be challenging. I'll just put that caveat in there, but it's highly beneficial for longevity factors. We're going to be touching on a little bit. Great question. The other question was about when to exercise and when to eat around exercise. It's best to exercise on an empty stomach, okay? If you, in fact, it's best to exercise in the morning, too, okay? This is pretty clearly understood. We have bursts of growth hormone in the morning, and growth hormone won't make you look like the guy on the far right. He's like, well, that guy grew a lot. No, that wasn't growth hormone. Um, growth hormone is a good thing. And we have a burst of that in the morning. That's, that's circadian rhythm we're going to be talking about shortly. That burst of growth hormone coinciding with vigorous exercise is highly beneficial for your body. But go ahead and have some intake pretty shortly after your workout. And this is where some carbohydrate intake makes sense. Some more carbohydrate in intake than you would have otherwise. Um, so if, do a smoothie if you can. A protein-rich smoothie that also has some of that fruit in there to give you some more immediate energy. We don't want you passing out. Now, if your workout is at, after work at 7 p.m., please don't misunderstand me. Eat breakfast, eat lunch, and even eat a little snack when you're on the way to the gym. No problem to eat with a little bit of food in your stomach. But your body is constantly doing a balancing act between long-term survival, you're eating for that, and you're sleeping for that, and short-term survival, which is ramping up your energy. These are the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches of the nervous system. And you want to be in a parasympathetic dominant state. That means rest and digest state after your meal. So if I jump straight off that and go in and see my buddy Eric who's training me and I'm, I'm doing functional training, he's got me doing all this crazy stuff, my stomach being full of food then is sending mixed signals. Wait a second, are you doing vigorous exercise now or are you digesting what you just ate? Does that make sense? Great. Uh, going back to the juicing question. Yes. It was really loud. I uh, know, I know. <laughs> You're good. Uh, so uh, you, you made the example of having the juice from the juice yeah. or eating the orange or yes, the orange juice. What if you like throw it in, do you lose the fiber if you throw it in like a, a blender or a I Vitamix? I love that question. That was a perfect, thank you, thank you. He's not You're a welcome. plant. I'm not, not a, plant. a plant. He's not. He's a man, not I'm a plant. I'm a human being. Ah, we're funny. We are. Yeah. We're we'll going so, the road later. <laughs> so um, that's ideal. If you are going to, in fact, want to consume uh, in a liquid format, like a smoothie, you're, it's ideal to actually pulverize the whole entity, so the whole fruit in there. And, and then you do get almost all of the benefit of that fiber. And I say almost because the process of mechanically chewing stuff, eh, there's a little bit of benefit in eating a whole fruit that way. But you get upper 90th percentiles benefit by juicing the entire fruit. And so that's a really, really great question. Those blueberries I had this morning that went in the Vitamix, I don't get endorsed by Vitamix, by the way. 
but the blueberries that went in there, they were pulverized, and the fiber that was in there slowed the sugar intake. And you know that, because I'm not running back and forth up here like a crazy man. So, wonderful question. My question is this. Um, first of all, I'm a living example of how your body can recover. I just lost 35 pounds in three months. Way to go. And this was intentional, right? Yay! Annie looks great. Annie looks great. Wonderful. And I work with a nutritional coach who's also a doctor. Great. And she got me, one of the things that she did fundamentally for me was I got on a program where I was eating six times a day. Yeah every two to three hours. So yeah. it's completely contrary to your notion okay. of intermediate fasting. Sure. But the point of eating that frequently, and I'm eating a little bit those, all those times, and I'm in a fat burn state, yeah. but I'm never hungry yeah. because I'm eating all the time. My yeah. body is saying, oh my God, you're full. And it, what I was doing was I was skipping breakfast and I was going from like dinner all the way around to lunch and my body was saying, you're starving, feed me, feed me, feed right. me. Right. Now I'm getting fed every two to three hours. I'm drinking a ton of water and I'm never hungry. Fantastic. So I don't mean to counteract your no, fasting please. point, but I wanted to, can you comment on that particular concept? Absolutely, and thank you for the question, truly. Um, this is a completely different concept what you're describing and your, your path, and by the way, congratulations, and good work, that's really what I should say. You weren't awarded this, you earned this. Um, what happens is when the body is in a decompensated state, or it's compensated as long as it can, and then we start storing excessively. Now I won't say, I mean, you look to be very healthy, we've just met, but you look to be very healthy, 35 pounds heavier, you probably needed to lose those 35 pounds, but you wouldn't have fallen into an extreme category even there. Okay, I'm glad you did it. Your body had compensated to a point where those meals at higher frequency intervals were necessary. You wouldn't move straight from a state where you had consumed a diet that caused fluctuations in glucose levels into intermittent fasting, right, like that. This is part of what I was describing when I said work with somebody who can help you with the induction phase or the introductory phase of this fasting. And also, it's not perfect for everyone, but we are seeing longevity factors engaged on a cellular level by doing intermittent fasting. Let me speak a little bit further to what your experience was, though. You do stoke the furnace of metabolism when you keep a steady state coming in and you're eating from healthy food choices, healthy categories. Let's say you're snacking on almonds, I imagine. Your walnuts, did you have healthy nuts you were eating and fruits? Um, yes. Uh, they, they have a, there's a particular proprietary program. Yeah. It was like soy, soy based bars. And sure. Maybe a, a boiled egg or something, but you know, I guess they were generally healthy choices. Good. So low fat, low sugar. Right. Absolutely. So, high, so when I describe a higher fat diet, you're probably going, I did exactly the opposite of that. Fat, from a dietary standpoint, is an unbelievably efficient way to take in energy. In fact, twofold. So the same, if you take a tablespoon of lipid, I know it doesn't sound good to eat a tablespoon of fat, but let's hypothetically say you're consuming a tablespoon of fat, and then you consume a tablespoon of protein and carbohydrate. Well, the fat has over twice the energy in that same tablespoon. Interestingly enough, the carbohydrate and protein have the exact same amount of energy, four grams. In both cases, the fat has nine grams um, per unit volume. So in that case, fat is an incredibly efficient way to eat. If somebody were inducing a intermittent fasting diet, they wouldn't be consuming copious quantities of this fat. It would be an exacting amount, okay? So that answers the lipid component. You're not consuming a ton of it, and you're taking into account that you're getting a, a very efficient exchange for your effort for the eating. Um, but the most important thing is by eating all day long like that, you did stoke the fire of your metabolism. Here's the difference. Your body can go into a state where it burns reserve fat for energy, where you're actually burning those reserves by doing the intermittent fasting I described. If you run a caloric deficit, which is what you did, you had to. To accomplish what you did, you had to run a caloric deficit where your body needed X amount of calories during the day and you were taking in less than that. And through maintaining that deficit spending, calorically, you achieved your goal. Okay, So it is a fine way to do it. There are certain reasons why 
it's beneficial to give your body a rest. And this mostly has to do with your digestive system works constantly in one category, and it has rest time in between meals in the other category. And this has more to do with enzyme depletion and balance. You did the right thing, you're at a healthier place than you were before, but just know that if you talk to your physician and discuss the possibilities of engaging intermittent fasting now that you've met your goal, you could benefit from some of the longevity components, and maybe that's done one day a week. Maybe it's two days a week that you intermittent fast like that. And then you can go back to eating the way you're eating now otherwise. Right. Yeah, great question. I think we have time for one more. One more. Yep. One more. Bill. Uh, Dan, are you familiar with a publication called Nutrition Action? Yes. I think it's published by uh, the Institute for Science and the Public Interest, yes. kind of like a consumer reports for food. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah th th thank you for that, that mention. Every time we talk, you've got great content. Um, but yes, thank you for that mention. It's an excellent publication, and there are many out there um, that are giving good information, but that one's an exceptionally good one. Okay, we're rolling into the next phase. Ten minutes. This is perfect, because the next two components are easy. All you got to do is sleep right and meditate. I'm done. See ya. <laughs> Here we go. Circadian rhythm. Let's talk about what it is. So... I love this graphic, it looks a little crazy, but what's actually being um, shown here is that light waves that are coming in to this individual's brain via receptors in the retina are feeding up to a little guy up here through multiple steps, but feeding up eventually to this pineal gland. And the pineal gland actually releases melatonin. So you can buy a supplement which is melatonin, but your body makes it on its own. And melatonin is engaged by the absence of light. So we sync with our environment, outside environment, or we can sync with our internal environment, inside environment, in a workspace or home by getting light from a device. So I mention that because mindfulness towards your device usage right before bed is very, very, very important. In fact, that's probably the biggest violation in, in sleep. This is a funny way to say it. The biggest violation in sleep circadian rhythm world that's out there now, but devices emanate light, in particular certain wavelengths of light that are blue, and that activates our brain and makes your brain think, well, it's go time. And then when you lay down and have some element of sleep disruption or even insomnia, it's very confusing. Well, that's not a deficiency in a pharmaceutical drug. Your body's not deficient in a pharmaceutical, a sleep aid, right? You don't need more. I'm just going to pick on one. Lunesta. I have a Lunesta deficiency. No, you don't. You've been looking at your screen too much. Not that lunesta never makes sense, but in general. Okay, back to it. So the secretion of melatonin from the pineal gland is what sets this cycle. So there's two things. There's only two things you need to know. Respect the biologic clock that runs on a 24-hour cycle. When you get up in the morning, if you can get into some light early in your morning, maybe it's your miracle morning walk, maybe it's a yoga practice where you can face the east, just because that's where the sun's coming up. I'm not getting all religion on you up here. I don't even know what that means. But <laughs> so face the east where you're sensing the sunlight coming in. Actually, the initiation of sunlight in the morning helps to switch this off so that melatonin is not being secreted and then helps set you up. This is the case with the body in many areas, but none so much as this, that sometimes the first step you're taking in the day is going to affect step two, three, four, and five that your body has to initiate and if you get off on the wrong foot, it just makes it harder. Again, the body's got an incredible capacity to compensate, but why put the strain on it? Get light in the morning. I actually went from wearing sunglasses a lot. I just try to look cool. No. <laughs> Obviously, I don't do that. But I went from wearing sunglasses a lot to now I only wear sunglasses if I am ride my motorcycle or in an airplane where I, I can't control for light and I might come into an obstruction that I won't got to watch out for. Don't be scared on the roadways. I use my sunshade if I need to. <laughs> But in cases of sunlight input to the eyes, wearing super dark sunglasses and blocking that input actually does have a bit of a deleterious effect to this. Now, direct sunlight into your eye, not a good idea. Please don't misunderstand me. We don't want you out there. If you're playing golf and it's a super, super sunny day, wear your sunglasses. Perfectly fine. But get that light input in the morning and don't get that light, put, light input at the end of the day. When the sun goes down outside, you don't need to put devices away then. I was on my device way later than that last night. But in general, if you mind that the light that comes in from your device does activate this pathway or blocks the release of melatonin, it makes a little more sense why you might have trouble falling asleep. 
Um, here's the research. You know I love these research studies. Um, this is actually not a research study. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Three gentlemen were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology last year for elucidation of this cycle. You think it's important? Three gentlemen were awarded the Nobel Prize, I'm just repeating it because it's so impactful, for medicine because they brought greater understanding of the circadian rhythm and its effects on health and wellness. This web address on the bottom there is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. I can't believe I remembered it. I know it's easy, but okay. American Academy of Sleep Medicine.org. They cited this Nobel Prize award and it says the recognition of Three circadian biologists in 2017 Nobel Prize laureates is not only a testament to their lifelong work, but reflects the recognition that sleep and circadian rhythms play important roles in daily biologic functions, like everything. Okay, back to it. Research such as this of Drs. Hall, Rosebosch, and Young has paved the way for future scientific directions that will include the incorporation of circadian neurobiology, how your nervous system is relating to the biological process in your body, into personalized approaches to health and wellness. People, circadian rhythm matters. It matters. This is a graphic that we won't even go into. Thank you. This is a graphic we won't even go into other than to say this is quarter, these are levels that were taken of hormones in patients that were challenged in their circadian rhythm, and the end result was early onset, early onset uh, cognitive decline. Okay. Incredible. I have references for all this. You can tell I'm into the references. I have references for all this stuff if you want more information, okay? I'm gonna actually jump past this and we'll do questions in just a moment. Meditation, mindfulness, and daily exercise. This is our number three. It's so important. It's not number three because glycemic control is more important. Glycemic control we just encounter up to six times a day, but at least three times a day, right? And circadian rhythm is an every night thing and sleep truly is so important. It pro sleep is probably the most important if I had to do that of these three things to have normalized. So this isn't three because it's not super important. It's just got tough competition up there. So meditation, mindfulness, wellness this way, stress that way, right? So it's a, meditation and mindfulness are a great way to interrupt the stress process and bring you in the other direction. And there are two broad categories of stress. You've got eustress, which is EU, and then stress, and distress, like I'm under distress. We are okay with eustress. I felt some of that before coming up in front of you today, right? A little bit stressful, but it's a great thing. I'm glad to be here. So, but distress we don't want to be dealing with. We want to move away from a distressful state and move towards wellness. Meditation is the best. It links the brain and the heart. You're stopping, you're breathing, and in this breathe, you're not stopping your breathing. <laughs> Whoops, you're stopping, comma, and you're breathing, exclamation point. And in doing so, you're actuating a muscle that actually allows for ventilation. Pushing air in and out is called ventilation. Respiration is actually the process of oxygen going into your cells and doing what it does inside. Kind of funny, right? Peeking out on this stuff up here, but ventilating, that process of moving air, can be a very relaxing thing for your body. It happens to be the only automatically mediated process in our body that we can go, eh, get out of the driver's seat. I'm gonna jump in here for a second and I'm gonna drive. We can consciously engage our breath in order to relax. And so I encourage you to um, check out a particular mode of abdominal breathing it's called. And the reason it's called that is you allow your abdomen to move in and out, okay? so. <coughs> For reasons of vanity, sometimes I don't do this, but not super vain up here, I'm just joking. When you breathe this way, you want to actually allow for proper excursion of your lower part of your abdomen because shape change has to happen here to allow for this flat muscle to drop up here and fill your lungs more completely. So, trying to do this, I can't breathe right. I have to go <gasps> to breathe and I'm using accessory muscles up here. This is very inefficient. These are turbo boosters. These are supposed to engage if I have to exert a lot of energy, but most of the time we want to breathe from here. So with belly breathing, deep breaths look like this. Watch the way a baby breathes. Watch the way a baby breathes when they're sleeping and you'll see their belly rising and falling, rising and falling. Their lungs aren't down here, but to allow for the proper filling and the volume change that happens up here, you have to have shape change here because this is open to the outside environment through my pie hole, <laughs> or my air hole in this case. I'm moving air, but down here is not open. It's not, it's a closed container. 
that question came up the other day. And I'm like, no, it is a closed container. And for this purpose, you have to understand this has to change shape to make room. So belly breathing. Look up belly breathing. This is big in yoga. And in particular, Dr. Andrew Weil um, is, a, is a wonderful medical doctor who is uh, holistically minded. And he promotes a certain type of breathing that he didn't invent, but he's been, the, that's where I learned it like a decade ago. It's called 7 8. <laughs> It's either 783 or 784 breathing. But the concept is you breathe in to the count of seven, you hold to the count of eight. Do this seated in the comfort of your office or home, not driving down the road. Please, 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 please. <laughs> you breathe in to the count of seven, you hold, again, abdomen out so your lungs can be full to the count of eight, and then you slow and steady exhale with some resistance. This is called ujjayi breathing in yoga, but you go. <sighs> that process of actually Making that sound is something called a glottis stop. And what you've done there is blocked your airway a little bit and controlled that exhalation. It's imperative for the relaxation response to be maximized. Now, you just sitting there and breathing consciously, you're already doing so much better than you do when you breathe under stress. But if you want to take it to the next level, like Chris Farley up here, didn't he used to say that? Take it to the next level. <laughs> I miss that guy. Okay, connection between brain and heart. Belly breathing, and particularly the type I talked about. This was very cool because this was published in Business Insider. How applicable. Look at us all business people here and doing this. So Business Insider pulled this together, and they did a great job of giving props. And they gave props to some wonderful leaders in holistic practices and, and meditation. That's in the fine print at the bottom. But businessinsider.com forward slash mindfulness dash meditation dash how to dash infographic is where this came from. But if you Google search it, you will find it. And this is a wonderful start to meditation. Effects of meditation, again, one, two, three, four, five, seven um, different sites of particular information talking about unique brain anatomy of meditation practitioners actually changing the physical structure of their brains through meditation. And then the balance and healthy aging, more information from Harvard, this is Tai Chi, but I'll tell you, yoga works exactly the same way in fall prevention. This is a very important area to focus on for wellness, especially as we age. Falls are devastating um, in our later years. And so it, fall prevention is crucially important. And engaging a practice like Tai Chi, which is very gentle movements that are controlled, it helps people find their balance, and it helps people maintain equilibrium and awareness of their body's position in space. Thank you all so much for your time, and I'm around afterwards to answer questions.